Hey everyone, I'm Ben Gramica from InterNACHI. We're gonna do a live interactive webinar in just a few minutes. So hang on there while I get my stuff on my side organized. Uh, technology is great when it all works. So let's see how this works. So we're gonna stream live on YouTube and the video recording will be available as well. Um, and also we're uh, doing a podcast and you can register for the podcast. Oh, sorry, we're also uploading the audio to a podcast episode um, on InterNACHI's Home Inspector podcast, and that's at natchi.org slash podcast. So you can listen to it as well. And um, if you wanted to register for the next free live interactive online training webinar for home inspectors, where we talk about home inspections, business and marketing, and being successful in building and growing your home inspection business, that's at natchi.org slash webinar. And so we're gonna start in a few minutes. We had almost 400 people register for today's webinar. That's pretty typical. Um, I'll try to get to all of your questions and answers, but we're gonna start in about mm, three minutes, okay? And if you are attending the live webinar um, that you registered through natchi.org slash webinar, feel free to ask questions. Um, you can use the chat feature. I'm not very good at the chat feature, but you could say hello. Uh, make sure you can hear me and see me. That'd be great. And you can use the Q&A feature. There's a question and answer feature. And I'll try to get to all of your questions. Uh, Sama, Kest, hello, thank you. Joseph, appreciate it. Hector Garcia, hello from Argentina. That's amazing. Um, we're, we are an international uh, organization, so that's awesome. Brian, Neil, Port St. Lucie, Florida, that's awesome. Richard, Chicago, uh, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Newfoundland, Canada. Dylan from Newfoundland, Canada. That's awesome. So if you wanted to ask questions, um, use the Q&A feature. I like it because um, you can give a thumbs up to really good questions and they bubble up to the top. And I'll try to get to the questions. I'm not very good at the chat, but you can say hello to everybody or chat somebody in particular if you wanted to have a conversation uh, live. Todd from Arizona, Brian Hill from Ohio, Amarillo, Texas, Joshua, thank you so much. Oh, let's see, I wonder if you can, let's share, I should probably share my screen. I'll share my screen in one more minute, okay? So um, we're gonna be live in about one minute. We're doing a, a stream on YouTube. So grab your coffee. I got my InterNACHI uh, mug here. Awesome, taking, Brian's taking his Florida Home Inspector exam today after the webinar. That's fantastic. Down in Florida, InterNACHI's um, home inspector exam is approved by the state for licensing. Um, so that's good. And if you go to the House of Horrors right now, you'll see there's a, a training class going on. There's a House of Horrors in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Colorado. And if you're looking to get the best training, hands-on training, um, go to a house of horrors. That's the best thing you can do. And uh, we have got three of them and we're building more actually. Uh, one in California, one in Texas and one in North Carolina. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, hey, from Calgary, Canada. Awesome. Come to California, Yolanda Park. Yolanda, how, how are you? you? You attend a lot over the webinars. That's fantastic. We are going to California. We're coming to Ontario, California, not Ontario, Canada, Ontario, California. Um, and uh, it's going to be the world's biggest inspector convention, uh, residential and commercial property inspectors and contractors and real estate agents and the best training, certified master inspectors and experts in the home inspection field are gonna be presenting there. Great time to get CE and internet CE and state CE. We've got uh, wherever you're from, it's gonna be approved. So um, take a look at nachi.org slash convention, N-A-C-H-I.org slash convention. 
All right, everybody. Thanks for coming to an InterNACHI webinar. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. So um, you can register for the next webinar. Everyone who registers gets the video recording so you can watch it later. And that's at nachi.org slash webinar. And if you are um, listening right now to a Home Inspector podcast, you're probably listening to InterNACHI's podcast um, on any platform like uh, iPodcast or Google Podcasts, Spotify, and that's at nachi.org slash podcast to get the details of the Home Inspector podcast and learn while you drive. Today, I wanna to welcome you to class and a couple things, like if you're watching me now um, behind me uh, in my background here, that's the URL for the InterNACHI school, uh, internachi.edu, internachi.edu. Uh, it's a home inspector college inside the trade organization of InterNACHI. And the trade organization is at nachi.org. Become a member and you get access to a free, tuition-free home inspector college accredited by a national accrediting agency of the U.S. Department of Education. So uh, it's an actual college. And then if I step aside, you can take a look at the URL for webinars, and that's at nachi.org slash webinars. So welcome to class, everybody. What we're going to do is inspect this house. I inspected it a little while ago, and we're going to review my home inspection and talk about performing a home inspection according to the standards of practice and exceeding those standards um, and using the standards of practice as a guide for your inspection process. Because if you have a process in place, then finding defects uh, makes it a lot easier. They literally jump out at you. And there's a few defects in this inspection. We're gonna review hundreds of inspection images from the inspection that I took. Uh, and we're gonna take a look at the 60 page home inspection report like to show you that. And along the way, let's talk about starting a business, growing an existing business, making more money, marketing strategies, inspection checklists, and report writing software, and anything else you'd like to talk about. So feel free to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature on your side. Um, the chat feature I won't be able to get to. And we'll go for an hour or two or maybe longer. And it's all, if you're attending the live webinar training class, it's free CE for you. For non-members, if you're not a member of InterNACHI, I'd like you to join the family. A one month free trial membership to InterNACHI, go to this URL, nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I.org slash free and enter the code webinar month, one word. If you'd like to get a discount, a 50% discount off of your first year as a member of InterNACHI, go to nachi.org slash free and enter the code webinar. And those codes are all caps and all one word. InterNACHI, we're the big organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We're headquartered in Boulder, Colorado. There's a house of horrors in Boulder, Colorado. There's one in Florida and one in Pennsylvania. Feel free to uh, join InterNACHI and take a look around, see what's available and why all of our inspectors are so successful. Be unaware of accredited, uh, be, uh, be aware of unaccredited home inspection training schools. The InterNACHI school is a home inspector college accredited by a national accrediting agency of the US Department of Education. We're an actual college and we have a home inspector certificate program with a nice certificate when you become a home inspector and all of our education, continuing education, training, online courses, they're all accredited, provided by a college, free and online for InterNACHI members. So never spend money at an unaccredited school. And you are attending a free live webinar right now, InterNACHI webinars, um, free online classes, interactive, nachi.org slash webinars, and the Home Inspector podcast. Uh, enjoy listening to something good. Uh, while you're driving around, going from one inspection to another, and that's at nachi.org slash podcast. And make sure you get your business online. So if you are an existing home inspector, 
take a look at the cost of having your home inspection business website online. And if you're a new inspector, you got to get online. As soon as you have a website and you get certified by InterNACHI, you flick the switch and you become live on the internet. And InterNACHI provides free inspection job leads, new potential clients, and we direct them to your website. To get a new website, where do you go? Nachi.org slash website, nachi.org slash website. And talk to Alicia. Uh, she runs a company and it's InterNACHI's official vendor for home inspector website designs, nachi.org slash website. This is a big house. This is a big house. I did it myself. Sometimes we have two inspectors coming to the job, um, but it was all me. And I had uh, three hours to do it. And I'll show you how to inspect this house in three hours and make a ton of cash. Remember, if you are an InterNACHI member, you can upload this live training class for free CE. Here's the inspection process. And it's all about time management. Because in business, you have to think about the amount of money you're making and the amount of time you're investing. Sometimes it's an investment of um, uh, capital, funds to make money. So you use your money to make money, right? But oftentimes when you're a home inspector and you're alone, it's you doing all the work, especially in the beginning until you're able to manage things, manage others. If you're gonna manage others, you have to manage yourself and it's all about time management. So think of a fraction right now. The top part is money divided by your time. You wanna increase gross revenue. You wanna have a big top number in the fraction divided by a small number, time. So you're making the most amount of money in the least amount of time. I'm not saying blow through a house and not and skip stuff. I'm saying be efficient with your time. And it's all about time management. No one wants to go to a six hour home inspection. No one, period. It's about three or four hours. Some inspections, like down in Florida, if you do a wind mitt or a four point, that's a lot less time. We're talking minutes. But if you're doing a full blown home inspection on a house this big that I'm showing you, it's gonna take a few hours, right? So you have to be, you're not gonna wear yourself out. You have to be efficient with your time. So here's my actual schedule that I used to do two home inspections every day and bring home or back to the office over a thousand bucks every day, $1,000 gross revenue every day. That's pretty good for a home inspection company. I start leaving my house at seven and I get to the first job early. If I can get there a quarter till the hour, that's, that's perfect. My first job is eight o'clock. My second job is at 12 noon. So my first job is eight. Second job is 12 noon. That's four hours apart. So I get there early at 745, knock on the door, introduce myself. I'm wearing my inspector garb, my ID. There's a shirt that I'm wearing that identifies me as an inspector. And I see if this homeowner's home, see if I can start my day. Usually they're, they're gone because we prompt our listing agents on the other side, the property owner to leave and have access to the house. But I'm gonna get there early. Why? Because I'm gonna inspect the roof and I don't let anyone up on the roof. It's just me and my ladder and my camera and my checklist. And if I can do that for 15 minutes, I'm way ahead of schedule. It's one of the most difficult things to, to do in it during a home inspection is the roof. The safest way to inspect a roof is to stay on the ground. According to the standards of practice, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. It's dangerous to get up on a roof, even if it's a flat roof, 10 feet above ground. It's dangerous to use a ladder. You can slip off the first or second run and break your leg. But in my company, we were trained. We were trained on ladder safety. We were trained, well, I used to be a home builder before a home inspector. So I knew how to actually walk on roofs and stall roofs. And we were very careful. And that was part of our brand too. We brought tall ladders to get to the roof. Nowadays, drone. Take InterNACHI's course to take the FAA drone exam and you'll pass it very well. 
and then be, become a drone pilot and fly a drone. Or you can use a, a scope like on a pole, or you can use binoculars, or you can use a camera that has a zoom, or you can just inspect from different vantage points. You don't have to use a ladder. You don't have to get up on a roof. So I get to the house early so I can do the most difficult thing in my opinion, and that's the roof. I don't need anybody else there. I might as well do it. And the second system I'm going, going to inspect is the exterior. And if my client isn't there either, the homeowner isn't there, their dogs, I'm going to inspect the exterior as well. So I'm going to try to get my day going as early as possible. And when my client shows up, I'll have some things done. I'll be all ready to go. And I'll be ready to talk to my client when they show up. Okay? Just real quick. Everyone can see? Good, good, good. All right. Some questions popping up. This is nice. All right, everybody. Eight o'clock, my sh client shows up because I'm done with the roof inspection. I did it already. Maybe I set up my ladder in a couple areas. Maybe I'm flying a drone. However you inspect the roof, get to that first. Yeah, and you don't have to. This is just how I inspect a house. I do the roof first. And I'm taking pictures and I walk upon every roof surface. And then I come down my ladder and my client is in the driveway. And I shake their hand, business cards. I explain what's going on in the inspection process. Try to confirm their expectations of what I'm here to do. I'm not here to find every defect in the house. I'm here to inspect the house and look for problems. And if I see a problem, I'll come and get you. But I, what I really would love to do is to educate you on how your home works, how to maintain it, and how to save home energy. That's really what I'm doing. And I'm a, along the way, in the next two hours, I'm going to tell a story about the house, their dream home. There's hardly anything I can say. If there's a hole in the roof, they're going to buy the home. It's hardly anything a home inspector can say to kill a deal. Home inspectors don't kill deals. We just tell the story of the home. 8 to 8.15, I'm, I'm inspecting the exterior. It's only 15 minutes, maybe 20, you know, if it's difficult to get around. And I have a pattern. I go counterclockwise around every home. And then I do the heavy lifting. Roof, exterior, and then the big stuff. And that's for me, HVAC, plumbing, the plumbing coming in, plumbing going out, and the hot water, and then electrical and foundation. Once I do those heavy systems, I call them, they're difficult. I'm in the attic and I'm working my way from top down through the interior. I'm doing the attic, insulation, ventilation, bathroom, wind doors, windows, walls, ceilings, floors. And I'm moving myself to the garage. If there's a garage, I'll do the garage. And then I end up in the kitchen. I want to end up in the kitchen. That's the heart of the house. And I want to end there. And I want to review the summary. I'm going to click a button with my software that produces a summary for everybody and then take a few minutes, maybe tweak the final report, and I'll have that available as well at the inspection or maybe at the end of the day. I am not writing an inspection report at night. I hope my competitors do, but I'm going to be managing my time, writing the inspection report as I inspect, and producing the report after the inspection ideally. And I charge my fee for the home inspection at the end and I get paid for the credit card. But I also get paid for ancillary services. Because if I go to a home and I just perform a home inspection, I feel like uh, I left some money on the table, so to speak. I didn't do enough in order to increase gross revenue. Remember the top part of that fraction divided by my time, I wanna increase gross revenue. And the best, one of the best, there's only nine ways you can make more money in the home inspection industry. And one of them is adding ancillary inspections, additional types of inspections to your home inspection and bundle it as a package for your client. Selling more stuff, more inspection services to each client is a great way to increase gross revenue. And then I leave. At about 11 o'clock, I'm done. And I'm moving on to my second job, which is at noon. I have a change of shirts. I have a change of pants, just in case I rip something that has happened before. I have shoes. I have outdoor shoes and indoor shoes. I have deodorant. I have mouthwash. I have mints. I have lunch. I pack lunch. I don't have time to um, go to Whole Foods or something and get good food. I don't eat fast food. I don't want to get fat. I want to be able to 
get into the attic spaces and crawl spaces. So I don't hit McDonald's. I prepare my lunch and I go to the next job and I'm home at about four, four thirty, before five for sure. And that's my schedule. Now take this schedule that actually made me um, very successful in my home inspection business, bought a house, got married, raised kids, all that good stuff, put them through school and compare it to your schedule. Maybe you only do one inspection a day. So maybe your time is a little bit different. Maybe you can extend your time, spend a little bit more, not too much, a little bit more time. Or you do two or more inspections a day. Use this as a comparison. Use this time management schedule to think about managing your time and being efficient. Same thing with your inspection reports. Write an inspection report and then compare it with reports written by certified master inspectors. In relation to increasing gross revenue with ancillary inspections, InterNACHI has over 60 different types of additional inspection programs offered by the only home inspector college on the planet earth, internachi.edu. So go to nachi.org slash certification in order to get trained and certified in ancillary or additional types of inspections in order to increase gross revenue. The standards of practice is the foundation upon which you build a successful home inspection company, or at least your process, right? Your inspection process is built upon that minimum standard. This is the absolute minimum. This is the absolute legal minimum. You have to, the standards of practice requires you to inspect a few things, and it also lists all the things you don't have to inspect. One of them is you don't have to find every defect in a home. And once you realize that, ah, then home inspections become actually kind of fun, right? And you have to communicate the standards of practice to your clients. Explain that here's what I'm here to do for you. And I'm not here to do these things. And then you use that standard, that standards of practice, as like a checklist in the beginning. And you incorporate that into your software. And hopefully you've found software that runs on a mobile device. So that you can carry it around with you, take pictures, take video, and write your inspection report as you inspect. You need a system in place. You need to have systems in place so that you're not doing everything. You don't have to think of every little thing. Your checklist is with you, essentially, helping you be efficient with your time, make sure you are inspecting what you need to inspect, and it also helps reduce mistakes, reduces your liability. So there's the roof at 745, I'm doing the roof and I'm up on the roof and I love pictures like this. That's my inspection vehicle there. Um, my inspection company was Peach Inspections. And we had a big peach on the side, Peach Inspection. That's a big van and that's my 40 foot aluminum ladder, uh, 32 foot fiberglass, 28 foot, 12 foot aluminum step ladders and tools. And, and so this is, uh, this is one way you keep people aware of your business. You know, you wrap your vehicle, inspection vehicle with your company and your services and your contact information and tell people to schedule and get a home inspection now, right? And on the back were my internet certifications. So this is a great marketing way. Uh, and this picture actually went on my website and in every inspection report so that I can show my brand. My brand is the answer to the question, why should you hire me? instead of the next inspector, because I get up on the roof. Now, remember, you don't have to get up on the roof, but if you're competing with me, you have to figure out how are you gonna compete with peach inspections? They get up on the roof, get a drone, get a pole, hire someone else to do it. Someone in your company who's a roofer, right? So I'm gonna make sure that this is part of my marketing. It says a lot that shows that I do something different from all the rest. And I wanna be able to just pound that into people that I use tall ladders to get to, well, maybe, maybe you can beat me in some other way. Maybe you use infrared and I don't, right? Remember, you're not required to walk upon any roof. But while I'm there, I'm taking pictures like crazy because they're free. 
So I'm snapping every thing that uh, I see. I'm walking on the roof if I can. I'm touching things and I'm taking pictures of every plane, every roof surface, every intersection where the roof comes in contact with something else and there should be flashing. Every edge, drip edge, rake edge, gable, ridges, as you can see in these pictures. If you're listening to a podcast, you can't see the pictures, obviously, but I'm taking pictures of everything that I can get my eyes on, looking left and right, up and down, even in the gutters. This is a great shot of a clogged gutter. This is another great picture of a gutter that needs to be cleaned. These are pictures from the ground. Now I get down off the my ladder, I'm taking pictures from the ground. There's a skylight, there's a fan, we'll see that later, there's vent pipes, there's a dormer, and there's damage at that trim board there. There's a chimney stack. I'm taking pictures of everything that I see and I try to enter those pictures into my software as many as I can, because it just looks good. But I also share those pictures with my clients. If you don't know how to inspect the roof, we have the education course for you. You go to natchiorg slash education and you do a little search on that page of all of our courses. We have over hundred courses, probably 150 courses, and you search for roof and a lot of roof courses will pop up. If you don't know how to use a ladder safely, we have a ladder safety course. You go to natchiorg slash education and you search for the word ladder. And if I was a manager of other inspectors, I'd force my inspectors to take safety courses that InterNACHI provides. And one of them would be a ladder safety course. If you're going to compete with an inspector who gets up on the roof, you may wanna be an FAA pilot, a drone pilot. And we have a course, it's based upon FAA preparation materials, and it's a free online course. And you can take it at natchiorg slash education and then you search for the word drone. Right there is a defect. Do you know what it is? Anybody know what that defect is? Lisa, first one. Lisa. Memolo, kickoff flashing. There's missing kickoff flashing right there. So as water comes down the roof and is intersecting with this edge here with the stucco of the siding, it comes in this area and there's usually a hole right here. There's a, there could be an opening. There should be flashing and it's big metal or plastic flashing. We call them elephant ears. Um, they, they look huge. They look like this. I'm cupping my ears. They look really big. The stupid big. The bigger, the dumber they look, the better they perform in my experience. Um, little pieces of metal that are custom fit by somebody up there with, some, with a knife or something. Uh, no, uh, that doesn't work. The problem is water gets right here and then it misses the gutter and then drains down the side or worse, it goes underneath the stucco exterior and no one knows about it until you get a home inspection. That's why every home should be inspected by a home inspector. There's certain things we're looking for. Obviously this contractor, either the stucco, the roofing contractor, the gutters, one of the, one, there's so many professional contractors, they all missed it or they know about it and they couldn't communicate and figure out when it goes on or who installs it or who's responsible. That's why every home should be inspected by a certified home inspector. So we can catch these things and help homeowners maintain their home by fixing problems early before they ruin a home. Here's an illustration at InterNACHI's illustration gallery and that's at nachi.org slash gallery. And we have hundreds of high definition illustrations designed by our marketing team, created by our marketing team. And this is a, a way for you to communicate 
to contractors or to a real estate agent or a client about what a kickout flashing is and what it should look like and what is actually missing. It's hard to describe sometimes in words. A good indication of a missing kickout flashing are the streaks, the black water streaks on the siding below the gutter end, like this one, and like this one, and like this one, and like this one, and like this one. So we have no kickout flashings anywhere. And while you're looking around for defects, bam, you have a defect here. This is the dormer. Um, it's probably a, one of those fake ones uh, or very small. It's an odd looking dormer for a large house like this, architectural. And the wood trim all around the dormer is uh, deteriorated, rotten. And that allows water potentially to enter the wall envelope where there's wood rot, there's cracking, there's openings, there's spaces where rainwater can get in, especially if you're in a, um, a climate that has a lot of rain, right? In order to inspect uh, the, what happens when there aren't any kickout flashings or what happens when the exterior siding or trim is rotten, it's all about moisture intrusion and detecting it, inspecting for moisture intrusion and trying to figure out if some things have come in. So you should have some tools, maybe not in the beginning when you're just starting off as a home inspector and you're building your business, but eventually you should invest in two tools that go together, an infrared camera and a moisture meter. An infrared camera helps you see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And a moisture meter is the follow-up tool. It corresponds, it goes, it's a companion with an infrared camera. An infrared camera can tell you an anomaly. Like you're looking at something that, that could be wet, it could be dry, it could be hot, it could be warm. But a moisture meter can confirm whether it's um, wet. So you need both. So we have training, as you can guess, and it's online and it's free for Internet G members and to become infrared certified. That's the federal registration certification mark, federally registered certification mark to be infrared certified, to use a camera, go to nachi.org slash IR, N-A-C-H-I.org slash IR to be infrared certified. Got a nice logo there. Learn how to find moisture intrusion problems for your clients. So now as I'm inspecting this system, the first system, I'm thinking of other things inside the house because a house is a system of interdependent parts where one part affects all other parts. And if you have a missing component of a system, kick out flashing at the roof system, then that could affect things on the inside of the house. So I'm gonna keep this in mind. Remember, I've got the roof to do, I've got my client showing up and I've got the exterior to do, and then I go inside. I have to keep all this in my head, right? That's why walking around with mobile software is really handy. You can write yourself notes to check for moisture intrusion caused by things, defects that you have found already during the roof inspection. Okay, according to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves, the roof covering materials, and that's asphalt shingles, and there's my vehicle. The gutters, and we've got some gutters here, and they're clogged. The downspouts, we've got downspouts. So I follow the roof covering. I'm thinking of rain and I'm inspecting the roof and the gutters and the flashing and the gutters are gonna catch that roof and then bring it down the house and to the downspouts. And here I have underground pipes. Okay, but the downspouts I'm gonna be inspecting because I can see those. I'm not required to inspect or report upon anything that's buried like underground pipes. And there's a disconnect between the downspout and the underground drainage pipe that it's supposed to be connected to, inserted into. This is a problem. It's separated. That's another one. There's a few of them that are separated. There's one that's connected. That's how it's supposed to look down here. But it looks like this. This is no good because um, this is gonna drain out and cause water, gallons of water during a heavy rainstorm to collect next to the house foundation. And now I have three things to think about, right? And it's all about water. I haven't even gotten to the exterior yet. 
kick out flashing, stucco, moisture intrusion into the wall cavity. I've got clog gutters. Oh, that's more clog gutters. I've got downspouts, right? Discharging next to the house foundation. I've got trim at that dormer near the attic at the roof, right? That could be leaking. There's, it's just so much fun. Now I've got a downspout that has been disconnected from the exterior wall. So that's loose. And here's another loose strap. I'm not required to inspect anything under here. I can't even see this. What is this? It's dense vegetation, we call it in the standards of practice. And I'm not sure where this goes. I think it goes underground. I could use my hand and take a look and a closer look. But remember, if it's restricted, it's restricted from your visual inspection, right? Good. I see some texting. Okay. The next thing, vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations. And the general structure of the roof from the readily accessible panels, doors, and stairs. So that actually is incorporating into the standards of practice something that you'll actually inspect later. I know of one person who inspects the underside of the roof before they get up on the roof. Um, that's a good safety uh, procedure. Um, it's a little difficult to do for me in, in the way I handle home inspections, but actually the attic inspection comes much later, um, about two hours later from right now. I'll be in this space looking at the underside of the roof structure, looking for that dormer with the water leaks, looking for structural issues, water penetration, ventilation, and insulation, and things like that. The inspection of the under roof attic space actually for me comes later in the inspection process, but here's a picture of it. According to the home inspection standards of practice, I've got to describe the type of roof covering materials. That's easy, asphalt shingles. And I have to report any need of correction of uh, active roof leaks. What if I see uh, a dry watermark on the ceiling of the second floor bedroom during my home inspection, which by the way, is the interior, and that happens at around 11, 15, 11, 30. See, it's all about time management. It's a dry watermark. I have my moisture meter, I have my infrared camera, I can use them. But actually, I'm going to call it out as a problem that we need to ask the seller about because they're having a home inspection, they know I'm coming over, and they know I'm gonna try to find problems, right? And the easiest thing to do is just look up. And if there's a bunch of water stains up there, they could have painted it. If it was a prior problem that happened years ago, it doesn't leak anymore now, they could have painted it and they didn't. Maybe it's still active. Maybe they don't even know it's there. I don't know. It's not my job. What I'm gonna do is, my job is to report upon the things that I observe that I think could be problems. It's actually written in the standards of practice. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to, you're not responsible for finding every problem. You're responsible for reporting upon the defects that you both observe and deem to be material. So if there's a defect above my head and I don't see it, it won't be in the report. If I see it, and I don't think it's a big problem. It's a um, cosmetic defect. It won't be in the report. It has to be both. That's my responsibility to put in the report those defects that are both um, seen by me at the time of the inspection and are really serious. I'm at the exterior now. It's up to the standards of practice. And if you click the natchee.org SOP, right? Let me bring this over. You get to the standards of practice. I love the standards of practice. Just reminds you of what you are really responsible for. And you click exterior, there's the standards of practice right there, right? And I love this part. The inspector is not required to what? Well, I'm not required to um, inspect inside the wall, right? I keep thinking of the water intrusion at that missing kickout area. If you're not sure how to inspect the exterior, Home Inspector College, internachi.edu, we've got the exterior courses for you. We've got a, a few of them. Um, you just go to natchi.org education, 
And in the search field, you type in exterior. Here's the standards of practice. I'm required to inspect the exterior wall covering materials. That's what it's called. You can call it siding, but according to standards or code, they call it exterior wall covering materials. The roof system, actually, you're not inspecting the roof system, you're inspecting the roof covering materials or the roof covering because the system has a bunch of components that you can't see. And remember, if you can't see it, you can't report upon it. You can't see the fastening, you can't see all the fasteners, you can't see the underlayment, right? You can't see the flashing, the step flashing, you can see all the step flashing, counter flashing, no. And that's part of the system. So what you really wanna concentrate on are your words. So right now, I'm inspecting the exterior wall covering materials. I just got finished inspecting the roof covering materials because that's what I can see, just the roof covering materials. So we got some stone, beautiful stone, beautiful stucco, except for the kick out and the water stains underneath the gutter ends. Really looking good. Little splash here, maybe the gutter is overflowing and splashing some dirt up on the siding, no big deal. Got some wood trim. That's the front porch there. I'm required to inspect the eaves, soffit, and fascia. Representative number of windows, obviously, I can't inspect all the windows. I'm not going to carry my ladder around and get to the third floor windows. So the standards of practice realizes that. That's why it's representative number. I'm gonna take a look at the windows on the outside and same thing on the inside, representative number of windows. And here's this, oh, did you see it? Yeah, I, I can stick my finger right there. So we've got wood rot. Reminds me of the dormer, right? I was checking out the roof and we saw some trim with wood rot. Well, we've got trim here with wood rot. So I'll take a picture of that. Some people will probably say that I caused that damage. Um, I didn't, but uh, that's why a photograph uh, before and after before you touch it and after you touch it is really valuable sometimes. Comes in handy. I'm required to inspect all exterior doors. There can't be that many. I'll be able to inspect all of them. Here's the front door, right? I'm looking for maybe trip hazards, maybe wood rot at the bottom. You know, when I inspect a door, I inspect it like I inspect a window, any hole through the wall envelope. I'm going bottom left, bottom right, top left, top right. I do the corners. Well, actually I do the top first, so top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Think of rain. So um, this looks good, storm window. Uh, there's a slider window as well, a slider door, sorry. Um, looks okay, I'm getting closer. There's the garage doors. There's three of them in this big house. Um, the bottom trim looks good. There's bottom right, there's bottom left. But one of the panels of the garage door is blown out, it's bellied out. It's pushed out from the inside. So we have a, a damaged garage door. I'll see if I can open and close it safely. If I can't, it'll be a restriction to my inspection. Again, bottom corners, because I'm required to inspect the flashing and the trim as according to the standards of practice. So I'm going around, flashing trim, here's more trim, here's more wood rot. It's at the front porch there. There's more wood rot here at the bottom there. I'm just using my finger, not really using a screwdriver. You know, for this house, I'm just pushing in and I can really feel the soft wood. I can push in that trim there, the header trim, the top left corner of a window that has wood rod in it. And then second floor, I can't get to the, all the windows, right? Representative number, second floor windows are really difficult too, but I can see from the ground that there's wood rot here in between the two with that big center window there. And I'm not going to spend any time drawing arrows digitally or a circle or adding text. My software can do that, but I just don't have the time. I'm trying to be efficient with my time. And this, I've got the best pointer in the whole world right here. It's on my hand, right? So a right hand is holding the device, left hand is my arrow. And there's the wood rot there. And there's the wood rot there. They, Patched it up actually before, and something's just up there. It's not, it's collecting water and it's not draining away. It's not, it's allowing water to go behind it and all that good stuff. So there's multiple areas of water intrusion. It's a good thing I'm infrared certified by InterNACHI and I'm holding an infrared camera and a moisture meter. There's more trim. Adjacent walkways and driveways. 
There's a walkway there, no trip hazards. There's a driveway, asphalt, uh, asphalt driveway, looks pretty good. Just walking around with my client now on the exterior. We're taking a look at things. Stairs, steps, stoops, stairways, and ramps. I like how that's written. Uh, here's the front entry door. Um, if I was a code inspector, this would be just fine. There's one, two, three risers, three steps. But if I'm a home inspector, we have more freedom. We're not code inspectors. So I often recommend a handrail here if my client needs it. So let's say my client is 80 something years old and she needs to hold on to people just to go up one step. Now imagine that being three times more difficult because she has three steps. So she needs a handrail and I'm gonna put it in the report as a reminder for my client that you need a handrail here. Now she can use it as a negotiating tool or just for educational purposes only. She could try to ask the seller to fix something that isn't required by code. The house was built to code back then. It's still built to code because code says when there are four or more risers, you need a handrail. But code, that doesn't help someone who needs a riser, who needs a handrail for every riser, right? Good thing I'm not a code inspector. I'm a home inspector. So I can uh, be... Uh, I can, I can lean on the side of my client's needs. Here's a exterior door and I'm required to inspect all the exterior doors. And obviously we have a large step here. So they're missing something. And then when I see this on an, ex, an existing home, I realized that um, the home wasn't built completely. Maybe some things were left for the new homeowner to do and they never did it. But we have a problem. So there's some trim that's loose here at the door. So that needs to be fixed. And then the front porch is actually, it's not made out of stone. That's actually paint and the paint is peeling. Um, the patio furniture has scraped away. Um, some of it's good, but some of it is just scraped away. So the paint there, that's not, that's not masonry damage. That's just a coating. It's, it's really cosmetic, but I'll put it in the report anyways for my client as a cosmetic issue. Um, handrails, guards, and railings. I'm looking for that. So we have that front step for three steps and maybe a handrail is needed there. Here's the rear slider door. Uh, wood rot right there, yep. So I use my finger as a pointer to give it some scale. And then that slider door there, the stationary window has some trim at the bottom. Because remember, I'm looking at the bottom corners and when you have a inspection process, sometimes defects just pop up. So I'm looking at the bottom corner of this slider door stationary window and at the bottom corner, there's loose trim, which doesn't hold the pane in place very well. It's coming out. So I took a, some moments to take a better picture so that my client can see that this window pane is actually moving out of the frame and that's a, a defect. And here's a more unfinished work. So these are slider doors coming from the living areas. I haven't been inside the house yet and they have them um, guarded up. So there's some guards there. And the space between the spindles is too, too large. It was built to code back then. Code allowed more than a four inches or more space in between the spindles. But in this guard here, I don't want any child to fall through. So even though the house was built to code back then, right now it's a safety issue for a small child, just like it's a safety concern, an assisted uh, accessibility concern for my very old client who can't go up one step without a handrail. Same thing, same issue. You're not a code inspector, you're a home inspector. So you're allowed to comment upon these things. You can inspect a home without any regard to when the home was built, actually. That's why I recommend. And then you take a look at vegetation and surface drainage and retaining walls where they may adversely affect the structure of the home. So I'm looking around the outside and I'm looking at the grading and the, the dense vegetation. Everything seems to be pretty good, pretty normal, no defects. I don't see any puddles forming or negative drainage. 
And I have to describe the exterior wall covering materials, stucco and stone and wood, and report as in any um, as in need of correction, any improper spacing between intermediate balusters, spindles, and rails. And so I'll do that as well. That's roof and exterior. But while I was going around, I'm bumping into other systems like I talked about before, because a house is a, is a system of interdependent parts. So there's parts, systems that overlap. So it's a, it's a call on you. How are you going to handle things that you find on the exterior, let's say uh, the electric meter or the air conditioning unit, when you're only inspecting the exterior, right? Well, it's very easy. When you're using a mobile device, you just go from exterior to electrical, and then you punch in your observations, and then you punch back out and go to the exterior again. So when you're using software that's in your hand, you can inspect several systems all at the same time. Here's a component of a system, that's the dryer exhaust. I'm not sure what this is, but I'm gonna take a picture of it and then figure it out later. It looks like it was installed after the home was built and it has a screen on it, so it can't be a dryer, it has to be something else. And uh, it's actually the vent for the bathroom downstairs. And there's some switches on the outside for lights. All exterior receptacles have to be GFCI protected. There's one there, there's one there, and I'm testing them with my GFCI tester and it's tripping on the inside. There's an exterior hose bib, a water faucet, a hose bib, and uh, it's not frost free. It should be frost free in this climate because it's gonna freeze. And so um, that needs to be fixed. We don't want these to freeze up and burst. And this one was actually covered by a, an insulation cup. So you hook it on the faucet on the other side of the house and you wind down the, the insulation cup on there because they know that um, it freezes. And so that's a good indication of, that's not a solution. The solution is to get um, a frost proof hose bib. So bibs that are subject to freezing temperatures, including frost proof hose bibs, should have their stem extended through the building insulation into an open heated or semi-conditioned space there should also be an accessible shutoff valve installed on the water supply pipe that leads the hose bib. There's a bit of a, a standard there for building, a building standard or code. Even though you're not a code inspector, you can use code to your advantage to make yourself a better home inspector. You can talk about frost-proof hose bibs. And that's an illustration right there. If you're trying to communicate what is your observation and what is your recommendation, um, use InterNACHI's illustrations, and they're at nachi.org slash gallery. You can download any, we have hundreds of illustrations, you can download any illustration to help improve you, communi you communicating in your inspection report. Remember the heavy lifting? I'm about to do that right now. So I did the roof, I did the exterior, and when I'm, when I'm saying like I did them, I actually inspected them, I communicated with my clients about them, and also, I'm done writing the report of those two sections. So next is heating. And I'm going to inspect, talk, and write all at the same time. Take some practice. That's why you should inspect your house uh, a dozen times, um, where there's no risk of you uh, failing um, with a client, a fee-paid client. So inspect your house and get really good at performing inspections using your software and always improve the way you communicate your report. Always work on your sentences, the terminology that you use, the illustrations that you use in order to help communicate your observations. Here's the thermostat, normal operating control. Here's the heating system. I know it's high efficiency because I have uh, plastic vent pipes for the exhaust and the air intake. And I have a sealed chamber with a little window there to look at the port. And also have a gas line coming down, gas shutoff valve, drip, hard line going into the system. I know it's distributed by forced air because I have duct work. So this is the return. It goes through the air filter, which is located here, up, circulated by a fan, accessible by the panel, goes up through the heating system. Air conditioner unit is there. I have an electric shutoff service switch right here. I have some tubes coming out. So I know that this is high efficiency condensate producing. Um, the air conditioner also produces condensate in this condensate drain tube, and they all connect down here into this 
strange looking trap, even with the condensate uh, from the furnace exhaust pipe, and it all goes down here. Hmm, pretty good. I don't know what this is. We'll take a look at it later. I take the panels off and I look at the system components. So there's a draft inducing fan, there's a condensate pipe, there's some condensate drain pipes, there's the pressure regulators, some safety devices, there's the gas, there's the... So all these systems and components you can learn about in our HVAC, advanced H HVAC class. Um, there was some condensate dripping out of this fitting here and they um, gooped it up. I'm okay with that. There's the port to see the sealed chamber of the high efficiency gas fired forced air furnace. There's a gas shutoff valve. There's a service switch and there's the air filter. And I explained to my client how this works. If my client is with me, that's great. So I don't have to say it twice or inspect it twice. So I love when my clients are with me so I can explain how this system works, how to maintain it, right? And this is one of the things that needs to be maintained by my client. And always take a look at things. Like if you ever see water dripping out of here, client, that's an issue. It needs to be serviced and cleaned every year. In fact, this furnace needs to be serviced and cleaned every year. And that's one of the recommendations I make. There's the exhaust pipes going outside. We see them outside. There's a return and there's exhaust for the high efficiency furnace. One, I have one in, the, in this house. Now, if you wanted a checklist so that you, you look really smart during your inspection, you're standing in front of the furnace and you're wondering what to inspect in what sequence, we have the greatest gas furnace home inspection checklist. And it's at this URL. It's a really long URL. So just click that. Uh, email me for the slides, bennettinternachi.org, and you can have the slides and they'll include the, the URLs. But the URL for the checklist is ready natchi.org slash three words with hyphens, home inspection checklist, home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist, natchi.org slash home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist. And there you'll find the gas furnace checklist and also about uh, 20 other different types of checklists. According to the standards of practice, I have to inspect the thermostat or I have to describe the thermostat, where it's located, there it is, the energy source, there's the gas meter coming to the house, um, natural gas, underlying pipe, regulator, valve, the meter itself, and it goes into the house there. There's the meter there. There's a pressure regulator and the pipe should be sealed to prevent vermin and water from entering. And then on the inside, I've got a manifold. Um, main line comes in, it's distributed, so I'll probably uh, gas furnace, gas fireplace, gas dryer, maybe something else, maybe another fireplace. And then um, uh, some controls and a valve drip, another valve. And I don't know what this is, but it should be capped. So it looks like this was like to a grill or uh, some kind of fitting, uh, natural gas and with a pressure regulator, kind of an odd thing. I think the homeowner did something like this, but um, there should be a cap here if it's not being used, if it's not connected to an appliance then it really should be a little concerned about that. This valve could be easily bumped by anybody and it could open up and just drain gas. That's not good. Hazard, very easy fix. The heating method, well, it's forced air because I have registers all over the house and also ductwork by the um, heating system down in the basement. And I need to report as a need of correction, any heating system that didn't operate or wasn't accessible. I didn't have any of that problem. Cooling system, heating, cooling, right? These are the heavy hitters here, heavy systems I'm trying to get through. Uh, and I'm, I'm expecting to be in the attic at about 10 o'clock. If I start at eight, it's all about time management. So there's the unit, cooling unit. It's buried, the base isn't above ground and it's kind of slanted to the side. So I use my hand in the picture to show that it's tilted too much needs to be leveled off a little bit, high efficiency air conditioning. I take a picture of the manufacturing label, the um, refrigerant lines and electrical line um, needs to be sealed up where it goes through the stucco. There's an electric shut off switch and there's the refrigerant um, coil, um, air, air conditioner coil inside with the refrigerant line, um, the, the two lines, um, liquid line and refrigerant line. 
And then there's the condensate pipe. And I'm looking for condensate coming out of maybe the, the coil uh, on top of the heating system. And it seems to be in good shape. And then the condensate drains into the floor. Ideally, it would be in a sump pump. You don't want gallons of water to be draining underneath your basement concrete basement floor. Ideally, it'd be in a pump where it can be controlled and monitored and discharged outside properly. I need to describe the location of the thermostat for the cooling method, just like the heating system. Um, it's the same thermostat cooling method distributed by air cooling system that didn't operate or was inaccessible would be a defect. I didn't have those and I'm into plumbing. Plumbing is my next section. At this moment, let me take some questions, okay? Hector Garcia, we don't have any regulations about home inspections in Argentina. Let's see if we can see this. Um, what could be the best way to convince our politicians on this? Many thanks. That is a, that is a, a heavy, difficult uh, question. Um, but uh, I'll be willing to answer it if you just give me an email, ben at internachi.org, and I'll try to help. Um, but it all takes a education. So um, we have people in Mexico and um, Portugal and Spain um, and in Greece, and we're trying to um, talk to real estate agents about the value of home inspections. And one of the best ways to do it is to just offer a free home inspection to a um, top producing real estate agent in your area. They like to talk about the value of getting something to their clients. So that's one way of doing it. Um, bottom up communication. If we can't stay the whole time, will there be a link? Yes, Ralph, uh, just email me, ben at internet.org and I'll send you a link um, to the video recording of the webinar. What if you damage the roof by walking on it? I, I won't, I'm trained. I've, installed roofs, but if I do, if I damage anything, I'm gonna fess up. I'm not gonna hide it. Um, I have damaged things in the past, um, like property. I've damaged uh, bowls in the kitchen, uh, coffee cups and things like that. Um, I've damaged um, uh, some railings, um, but that is a call. Uh, I've damaged garage doors, they've fallen. Um, I've damaged, um, wood rot by sticking my screwdriver in them, uh, pipes, cast iron pipes by uh, pushing on them with my screwdriver. So if I damage someone's property, like I dropped a vase, that's on me, right? If I damage uh, wine that was in a refrigerator and I tripped the ground, ground fault that it was plugged into and I didn't reset it, that's on me. But if I find damage, like if something damages, uh, something crumbles in my hand, a piece of wood, a pipe, a gutter, a downspout. Uh, if a window falls out while I opened it, I didn't, I, I didn't damage it. It was damaged and I found the damage. If I use normal operating controls for the heating or cooling system or the garage door opener and the garage door fails, it comes the, out of the rail or something like that. Something happens while I'm inspecting according to the standards of practice using normal operating controls. If the dishwasher leaks on the floor um, because I turned the dishwasher on, these things are not my responsibility. These things I'm supposed to find. I'm supposed to create these problems and put them in the report and communicate them to my client and to the homeowner. I'm supposed to find problems. And if, they, if I damage them, if I create problems, like uh, I fill up the Whirlpool tub in the master bedroom on the second floor, and then I drain it, right? And it's never been used because no one uses those things. And, it, and the drywall falls in the kitchen, right? Because of all this water coming out of the tub because the plumber forgot to connect the pipe. I caused that damage, but I'm there to cause that damage. I'm there to find those problems. If I flush the toilet, and it leaks all over the floor and into the crawl space. I'm there to cause that problem. Uh, it's not my responsibility. I'm there to find that problem, even cause it to fail if, in, if it's in failed condition, right? So uh, that's your job to cause damage, essentially, according to the standard of practice and using normal operating controls. 
But if, if I, uh, like I said, I tripped a ground fault in a garage and the wine that was chilled got warm. Well, I use that to my advantage because that's what we train in the home inspection business course at Internachi. You, if you do something like that, what you do is you take full responsibility and you make sure everybody knows that you've made everybody whole again, that you have fixed the problem. So I came back with wine and money and flowers. And I made sure that the seller talked about it. The seller talked to the agent and the agent talked to the other agent. And now that story spread through the real estate office. Now everybody knows that, oh, this happened, but Peach Inspections, the home inspector made everybody whole again, and even more so. They made a mistake and everyone is good. Everyone's a win. So um, there's two damages, two types of damage. One, you have to take responsibility for. And the other one, which is more common, are the things that fail right in front of you because you're the home inspector and you are required to find those problems, right? Required to report upon those problems that you found. Um, find it hard to finish a home inspection in three hours. I see from the schedule, you need to cut, which means cutting smaller stuff out. Do I draw a line? Well, you just need to practice, I would say really is. A home inspection on a three, 4,000 square foot house, it's 15 years old, um, should be about three hours, most. And that's a full home inspection with a client and family walking around, talking, inspecting, taking pictures. So in the home inspection business course, we te- and in the master class, there's a master class for home inspectors. And in the, in the introduction to home inspections course, so many courses, we teach you to practice Practice, practice, practice. Get your software and practice. Like, for example, go into the kitchen, practice on your own home, right? Go into your own home in your kitchen, get your software out, go to the kitchen section of your software and inspect the kitchen in less than 10 minutes because that's all it should take. What are you doing in there? Cooking something. What? And go to the bathroom, right? The half bath should be two minutes. Flush the toilet a couple of times, hot and cold water, GFCI, feel the secure, is it secured to the wall or secured to the floor, door, walls, ceilings, fan, window. That's about it. A couple minutes in the bathroom. If you can't inspect a bathroom in a couple minutes, half bath in a couple minutes, yeah, you just need to practice. That's all. Don't cut stuff out. Don't not flush the toilets in order to be faster. Don't not turn the dishwasher on because you need to cut time. No, you just need to practice. Comment on small stuff. Worry about uh, error and omissions issues. Go to natchi.org slash insurance and get help there. Natchi.org slash insurance. Kick out, kick out flashing. What was shingles are happening about electrical wires lying on the ground? Do you report that? Yeah. Um, uh, Electrical wires should not be laying on the ground. Yep. Um, uh, Please repeat or recommend. Uh, please repeat what you recommend for the upper level patio doors with guardrails only for better safety. Um, there's nothing to do. I mean, the guard is there. The space between the spindles is too far apart, um, small enough for a child to fall through. That's a safety feature. That's a, but the guard is there. So there's really nothing to do. Um, you don't, there's no requirement to add a big deck to every slider door, second floor slider door. It's nice, but you need something to prevent someone from falling. And that's a fall protection device, that guard. What about Aruba? Yeah, I think we should start a chapter in Aruba for sure. I know I better go there this year. When are you considering uh, ready to seek paid inspection? When are you considered ready to seek paid inspections? Oh, um, I would say when you can inspect your home on the 10th time within the time that you have given yourself and you give the report to someone like your friend or your spouse or your your child or some your neighbor and they understand what you're saying so you you test yourself you do an inspection and then if your report is easy to understand and clear to read right then you've done well you're ready to go. I would then do your neighbors and make sure that they get value 
help your neighbors who don't have kickouts, right? Help them. Help them understand how to maintain their home. Right? And if they can understand the report, you're getting there now. You're really getting in there. Next one, you might want to find a real estate agent. Have them read a, one of your inspection reports. Is this what you expect as a real estate agent from a home inspector to write in their report? Now you've got it down. Yeah. But that's only one thing you need to do. Big deal. You can do a home inspection. But can you run a business? So you have to think of yourself as a business owner who just happens to do home inspections. And you don't have to be the world's greatest home inspector in order to be successful. In fact, you should probably think of yourself as an average home inspector. There's usually someone better than you. There were many inspectors, most inspectors. I'm not the best inspector, but I was able to run a successful home inspection business. And that, that makes all the difference. So you have to get trained, not only at performing inspections, but on running a business. And so go to the Internet Chief's page for courses, natchi.org slash education and search for business and take the home inspection business course. Okay. Um, I can tell the age of the, how can you tell the age of the roof after about a thousand inspections, you can tell the age of the roof. What, what if water is turned off to the home um, before, when you schedule an inspection, you should have a system in place, a list of things to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, we do this first and we do this. And then we send out an email and send out this person. And one of those communications is to the listing agent who's going to tell the homeowner to make sure that the water's on. And if it isn't, it's okay. I usually do the inspection and I say to my client, hey, you know, we told everybody to turn the water on. They didn't turn it on. Wait, I, well, I can come back. It's going to cost you a hundred bucks. Uh, how to call an anti-tip bracket on a range oven. Yeah. So I grab every oven and I just push it back and I look back there and I take a picture and it should be back there. Yeah. Anti-tip. That's great. Uh, let's slide this over. Let's say plumbing. Lots in the plumbing. Water shutoff valve. Do you see it? See, this is why like inspecting existing homes with occupied uh, sellers there is a lot of fun because it could be kind of hidden and it's there. There's the water shutoff valve. It's actually tagged, which is really nice by the water company comes through the foundation wall, up through the pressure regulator, check valve, and the, that is a defect. It's filled with water. Um, the pressure gauge uh, is filled with water. That's an easy call. The main water, uh, main water shutoff valve, that's a one to show your client. The fuel supply shutoff valve is usually at the meter, and we saw that before, and it's right there. Water heating equipment, that's the, that's the water tank, the water source, um, and also the, the valves and all the components. So the top looks good, the bottom looks good. It's gas uh, fired. There's the water shutoff for the in, gas shutoff valve for the flames, um, temperature, um, the uh, manufacturing label, 48 gallons. That's uh, efficiency, high efficiency. There's the exhaust pipe going outside. We saw that on the outside by the hose bib that should be frost proof. Um, and TPR valves, there's missing TPR valve extension. According to code, there are 14 requirements just for the pipe that's connected to the TPR that extends to the floor. You don't have to know them all, but you may want to have them in your software so you can refer to them. So one of them is it has to exist. And this one doesn't even exist. It has to extend down to near the floor. So that's a defect there. Easy fix. You have to inspect an interior water supply, including all the fixtures by running all the water, flushing all the toilets and doing all the tubs and sinks and uh, all that stuff. Don't skip anything because you, you can't get it to three hours. You have to do all these things according to the standards of practice. You have to inspect all the pipes. So there's the, there's the drain waste vent pipes there. Um, limited access. I can't see everything because most of the basement is finished. And if there's any drainage sump pumps, I'm gonna take a look at that. There isn't. Um, determine if it's public or private, it's public. Water, uh, water meter is a good indication of that. Um, location of the main water shutoff valve, uh, location of the fuel shutoff valve. We saw these things already. 
Um, you just have to describe where they're located. I like to show my clients where they're located. Any storage tanks? No. Uh, the capacity of the water heating system? Uh, just some data that the standards of practice requires you to, to document. And it's 48 gallons. I don't comment on whether it's too small or too big. Not required to. Report as a need of correction. Any problems like deficiencies in the flow when you run two fixtures at the same time? So in the bathroom, I'll flush the toilet, run the sink hot and cold, and then turn on the shower. Just like that. And that should be functional flow coming out of the shower head. Hot and cold water problems, active plumbing leaks. Obviously, if you see an active plumbing leak, that's a defect and toilets that have problems. Now you could group all the bathrooms together in your inspection report, but in my inspection process, I don't get to the bathrooms all at once. I do them as I come down from the attic and I work my way down. Um, but you may want to group them just because you didn't inspect them all together doesn't mean you can't group them all together in order to make your inspection report a little easier to read. So that's what I do. I group in my report, I'll group all the bathrooms together. So this is the basement bathroom, GFCI, tub, shower, sink, no leaks. I know it's an S-trap. Basement bathroom doesn't have a plumbing access panel. So I'll use, this is an X. I don't do, uh, I don't have enough time to draw an X digitally on my pictures. So I'll just use my fingers. A master bathroom, there's the sink, two sinks, drain pipes, GFCI protection, shower. I pound on the tiles with my hand on the shower walls and the, the glass there. And I try to direct the shower onto the glass corners to make it leak. Again, some unfinished things. There must've been a sink that was going to be installed here. It wasn't. There's some electrical things that are open and oddly placed, unfinished electrical work that's live. And there's a tub there. There's a tub access panel right there. And I'll open it. There's a GFCI, the pump, circulator pump is plugged into a GFCI. That's nice. I'll take a picture of that. And I'll fill it up with water and I'll circulate it and I'll turn the jets on and see if there are any leaks. No leaks here. Make sure it drains without any leaks in the, in the lower floors. Nice and bubbly. That's good. There's a full bathroom. So that's, there's three full bathrooms here so far. Two sinks, drainage, GFCI. I'm not really crazy about P traps and S traps. Um, if it gurgles, I'll mention it. It's an S trap. It shouldn't be. It should be a P trap. GFCI, pound on the tile walls at the shower and tub, pull on the soap dish, and the shower works. And this is the vent for the bathroom. And it has a tub itself, a jacuzzi. I'll fill it up, turn the jets on, drain it, and see if I find any problems. There aren't any except for that. It actually leaks. And I doubt that the seller even knows. So it's leaking right there. I'll try to take a picture of it. I'll put it in the report, active plumbing leaks observed. It'll be in the report. Electrical. I have to inspect a bunch of things in the electrical system. It looks like a lot, but it isn't actually. All of these are grouped together. So the service drop is a service drop overhead, the attachment point, the service head, the gooseneck, the drip loops, the service mask, the conduit, the raceway, the electric meter and the base. They're all kind of like in the service entry conductors. They're all kind of like in one big group, right? You can inspect them in seconds. Okay. so. According to the standards of practice, I have to inspect the service drop. Um, service, what's a service drop? Well, electrical service te terminology is really important for home inspectors in order to communicate clearly, maybe to even contractors. And we have an online course, how to perform residential electrical inspections. And we go over service terminology and we have an example, we have arrows and we describe every part, every component of the electrical system. So it's a really good course. I highly recommend taking InterNACHI's free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course. It's really good because you're required to inspect all these components of the electrical system, including the service drop, overhead conductors, attachment point, 
service head, gooseneck, drip loop, service mask, service conduit, conduit, raceway, electrical meter, and base, service entrance conductors. And there's the meter there and this home inspection. You can see it's attached to the house, but there's no service mast. There is an underground conduit in this inspection picture. There's a service entrance cable going out of the meter and through the exterior wall, heading to the main disconnect at the main electrical panel board. That needs to be sealed to prevent vermin and water intrusion. And there's the grounding. You have to inspect the main service disconnect. That's usually at the panel. Sometimes it's outside by the meter, depending on where you are, like in California, then it'd be outside usually. Main service disconnect must be clearly marked. It is. The main disconnect must be either inside the house or outside the house as close to the service conductors where they enter the house. It can't be in a bathroom and no more than six breakers can be used to disconnect the service conductors. So we have a 200 amp panel main disconnect. Two fingers means 200 amps for me. Panel boards, overcurrent protection devices, that's the breakers and fuses. Um, there's the main disconnect, this is the main panel with a disconnect. There's the breakers there. I take a picture before I, I open the door and I take a picture of it. Make sure I document what is going on before I touch things. And right here, I have a GFCI that has been tripped off and I'll reset it because I tripped it when I was inspecting the receptacles on the outside of the house. You're not required to remove the dead front cover according to the Internet G standards of practice. I do in order to see what's inside. It's not safe. We're not recommending that you do it, but some inspectors do. I have two more panels, sub panels. There are the breakers to the sub panels. There's one hundred amp breaker and there's another hundred amp. So I know I got two sub panels, a big house. Surge protection. There's sub panel number one. There it is there. I take a look at the breakers and the wires and the neutrals and the groundings wires are, are separated. All looks good. Sub panel two, the GFCI is tripped. I'll reset it because I tripped it already. There's one breaker that's in the off position. It has duct tape. It's, it was torn off. It was secured, I guess, but I didn't tear the duct tape. I took a picture of this panel and you can see the duct tape was torn off already and the breaker was in the off position. This is the GFCI breaker that was tripped off. That's me. You can reset a GFCI breaker, but you should never ever reset a breaker that has been turned off or tripped off, right? Breakers shouldn't be tripped off and they shouldn't be turned off and then turned back on. You could activate something that you don't want to activate. A GFCI, of course, you can... Reset an AFCI, yes, but a GFCI, and even an AFCI is, be careful. If you're testing the AFCI circuit, you have to know that you are testing it and have someone to even help you. That's really nice to have another helper with you. Careful resetting anything, GFCIs or AFCIs. GFCIs, you're probably okay. AFCIs, careful. And a turned off breaker, forget it. Or a tripped breaker, don't. It tripped for a reason and it's turned off for a reason and I'm not reactivating it. But guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna document it. And I'm gonna ask this, my client to ask the seller to uh, explain what's going on here, especially with the duct tape. It is connected. Sometimes breakers that are not used are turned off, but this one I can see because I removed the dead front that's connected. So I'm not gonna turn it back on. The neutrals and grounds are split. That's great. At a sub panel, I have a 20 amp breaker. It says dishwasher, but it's on a 14 gauge circuit wire. I know this is a 14 gauge circuit wire because I can find it and bend it or even look at the labeling. So back to the breaker, what we have here is a defect because this is a fat breaker on a thin wire. You want to, you want these two to correspond. If this is a 14 gauge wire, this has to be a 15 amp breaker max. And we have a 20 amp breaker. This is allowing too much current to pass through the small wire. That's a defect. There are also, also wires hanging around and uh, literally, and they're live and they're um, a defect. Uh, this needs to be capped off, 
finished, secured. This is no good. So someone is finishing the basement and just didn't finish their work. And I have another sub panel and the breaker is tripped off. I'm not gonna reset it. And it's not labeled either. And these are uh, exterior wires, so it has something to do with outside. That's it, I have no idea because the directory isn't specifically labeling, identifying the breakers. So there's only so much I could do. So I'm just gonna put it in the report for my client to ask. I don't talk to the homeowner directly unless I need to. Um, I'll communicate everything through my client. I'll put it in the report and they can ask for whatever they want to ask. I'm required to inspect the surface grounding and bonding. There it is, grounding, bonding. And there's the water shutoff valve. Again, on the inside, another shutoff valve. I'm not sure where it is because I can't tell. Um, this is an access panel to what looks like the, a main water shutoff valve. I have no idea what it's for because everything is behind a finished wall. But I know that bonding is required where needed to ensure electrical continuity and the ability to carry a fault current to a path to grounding. And the metal water pipe must be bonded to the service equipment enclosure. And that's code. So I'm looking for a bonding wire, usually right next to the water meter, ah, shut off valve. There's the grounding rod on the outside and the upper end of the electrode, the grounding rod should be flush with the ground or just below the ground surface so that the end and attachment are protected from damage. If you find a rod, a grounding rod sticking up out of the ground, that's a defect. It should be at or just below the soil surface. And the inspection image here, the rod is visible. And we actually describe all this grounding and bonding stuff in that really good course that I referred to before, how to perform residential electrical inspections course. We talk about what is grounding and what is bonding. We give examples and illustrations we talk about rods and clamps and attachments and water meters and bondings and oofers and uh, everything, okay? Oofers, oofers. So electrical bonding and grounding, that's difficult for a lot of inspectors to grasp onto, but we've got the best course for you. You're required to inspect a representative number of switches, lights, receptacles, including AFCIs, and then test the GFCIs. So representative number, you don't have to test every wall receptacle in the house, that'd be forever. And GFCI, so all exterior receptacles are GFCI protected, for example, all bathroom receptacles, all kitchen counter receptacles, garage receptacles, laundry. Uh, and also you're required to inspect for the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. There's a smoke detector, the battery is out. It's very easy to fix. This one is actually missing. We have a missing, detector, smoke alarms must be powered by the building wiring and they have to have a battery backup. If you find an old detector without a battery, that's a defect, it's an easy fix. They should be interconnected so that when one alarm activates, all of them do. And they should be located in each bedroom, outside each sleeping area and on each story, including the basement. And carbon monoxide detectors should be installed for houses that have a fuel fired appliance or an attached garage with an opening to the house, outside of each be bedroom, inside of each bedroom with a fuel burning appliance. And they need to be interconnected, just like the smoke detectors. And you're required to describe the main service disconnect amperage rating, remember my two fingers, that's 200 amp, and the type of wiring observed. So we got the 200 amps there, and it's a typical NMB wiring. And you're required to report on any of the problems. And those problems are specifically listed in the standards of practice. So we've got problems with the service entrance conductors, any unused breakers uh, in the panel opening that was not filled, um, presence of solid conductor aluminum branch circuit wiring. That's no good. Um, any tested receptacles that weren't live or GFCIs that are not testing properly or an absence of smoke or carbon monoxide detectors where they're needed. Now the foundation, right? I'm almost done with the heavy stuff, those big systems. I'm still in the basement in this house doing the heating, the cooling, the HVAC, 
the electrical, the hot water, the plumbing, the drain, waste vents, and now I'm getting to the foundation. And according to the standards of practice, I have to inspect the foundation, basement, crawl space, and structural components. And the basement here is basically finished with some unfinished components like electrical and plumbing. So there's a missing light fixture there. There's some wires hanging out of the wall there and also there. And there's some plumbing, unfinished plumbing, some pipes, some stems, an electrical junction box and a drain pipe and a plug and some damage to the vinyl flooring. So I can't see everything. A lot of things are covered up by insulation and drywall and personal items. But I'm looking around and snapping pictures, looking for defects in the surfaces and also water intrusion, right? So here's some perforated four inch underground drainage pipes that we use to collect water underneath the basement floor or in the perimeter and just collect that water, maybe dump it into a, a sump pump. But that wasn't done here, it was brought up for some reason. They didn't put it in a sump pump pit. That's okay, but if there is a water problem in the home, in the basement, maybe this could be actually changed and the underground drainage pipes can be used, but this area right here, maybe a sump pump pit could be installed if needed. Some hoses, maybe for some gardening or something like that, kind of odd that it's in the basement, but there they are. And then I have my moisture meter tool. This is a hydro shark. You can find it at uh, inspectoroutlet.com. Um, and then it has two probes and it's detecting moisture and it will give you an audible and a visual signal. And uh, it's not telling you, it's not measuring anything. It's just giving you a, um, uh, an indicator, an indication of moisture because home inspectors, we don't measure moisture content. You could, you can measure moisture content and humidity levels and things like that, but I don't. I just wanna know, is the carpeting and the padding and the flooring underneath here, is it wet? You have to describe the type of foundation and the underfloor crawl space areas. And if you're a little weak on structural, we have a, a structural issues textbook. We also have a structural issues course. We have a structural, uh, articles. So we have a ton of content for you if you're in need of that. And there's a few things that you have to report upon as a need of correction, like any wood in contact with dirt. We don't have that. Any observed indications of active water penetration. I don't have anything like that. I could see things like the kick out and the, the trim and things like that on the outside, but I don't see anything on the inside. Observed indications of possible foundation movement and any observed uh, cutting or notching or boring of framing members. I don't have any of that. I'm in the attic. I'm done with, at this point, I'm feeling really good because if I'm gonna move to the attic, it's about 10 o'clock and I know I've got about an hour left and I'm gonna get paid at the end of this inspection. And that's my goal, to do a great inspection, educate my client, write a report, and then head to the next one. And in the, in the attic, I'm required to inspect insulation, ventilation, and mechanical exhaust systems. So there's the attic space. We've seen this picture before of the underside of the roof, asphalt shingle roof. I'm looking for any structural problems or active water leaks or wood rod or anything like that. I don't see anything, it looks really good. There's a lot of storage, I can't see everything, but what I do see, I don't have any major defects. This is one of those uh, things that I can talk to my client about so that they can save home energy. So this is an interior door that leads to the unfinished attic space. And it's an interior door, it's not, a, not an exterior door, it's a bedroom door. So it's not insulated. It's not weather tight. There's no weather stripping. There's a lot of air and heat loss here. So we can talk about this essentially being a large hole in the building envelope. I bet the heating costs and the cooling costs, 
heating costs, especially in the wintertime, are extraordinary because this door is just essentially an open hole. It's not insulated and it's allowing a lot of conditioned air to escape the house into the in unfinished attic space and leave. And uh, that's a lot of energy that could be saved. So we have that. There's the roof fan providing ventilation. And I'm required to inspect the mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen. There's that. The bathroom has a window and the laundry and that exhaust outside. And you have to describe the type of insulation. It's fiberglass insulation, the approximate depth of the insulation and report any need of correction of any missing insulation. Okay, in the interior, I'm moving the interior now. And basically I come out of the attic and I'm working, working my way down. I'm gonna go through the interior rooms um, and the bedrooms and the bathrooms, get to the garage. And then I go into the kitchen and I finish up in the kitchen. And it's a representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them. Floors, walls, and ceilings, stairs, steps, landings, stairways, and ramps, railings, guards, and handrails, and then you get to the garage. So there's a, a missing light fixture component at the ceiling fan. There's some unfinished wiring down in the basement. Uh, the floors look good, representative number of wall receptacles. There's some drywall cracking, pretty common. This window is in good shape. It tilts, the skylight looks in good shape. There's a crack there, it's pretty common at the top right corner. It's not major structural. There's the bedrooms, more wall receptacles, switches, floors, corners, windows, doors. This window wouldn't lock. The lock just would not work. There's more wall receptacles. And then you get to the garage. You're required to inspect the garage uh, um, vehicle doors and the operation of the garage vehicle door using normal operating controls. And there's the garage openers, there's three of them, and they're all connected with extension cords, which are really for temporary use only. I'll put that in the report. But they're supported well, springs, safety lines, safety cables. Remember the damaged bellied out panel of the garage door, or I can see it from the inside now, somebody whacked it there, but it opens and closes still. The garage ceiling looks okay. I don't see any problems. There's a lot of storage. I can't see everything. A lot of things are you know, blocking like that door there. I can't open it. And I don't want to because remember there are no steps outside. So that's a safety issue because somebody could open that door and run right out. That'd be terrible. And there are a lot of storage and every receptacle in the garage needs to be GFCI protected. There's a missing plate there. And the photoelectric eyes of the garage door, I always test them with my foot. Fireplace, we do have a fireplace. I knew that from the outside when I saw the chimney stack. Um, so we have two fireplaces. We also saw that at the manifold as well, the gas manifold down in the basement. So there's one fireplace that's in the master bedroom. It was off, but I turned it on. Flick of the switch, the gas valve is already on. I don't turn gas valves or water valves. If it's on, I'll turn it on and it worked. There's another fireplace, gas fireplace insert, has a little circulating fan. That's really nice. It wasn't plugged in though, and it wasn't wired properly. So that didn't work, but the um, unit itself turned on with a flick of a switch. I'll turn that on, make sure the damper is open. I'm required to inspect the components of the fireplace including the damper door. I'm required to describe the type of fireplace and report upon things that need correction, like damage to a fireplace or a lack of smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors. Laundry, that's part of the interior as well. Sometimes it's down in the basement, sometimes it's near the kitchen or on the first floor and the second floor. And there's GFCI protection is needed, electric dryer, hot and cold water lines, and the discharge and the exhaust, mechanical exhaust from the dryer. That's all good. 
And then the kitchen. Now you may want to include the kitchen in the interior section, or you may want to put it as a separate section. I do it as a separate section. When I get to the kitchen, run hot and cold water at the sink. We've got two sinks in this kitchen. There's a garbage disposal, turn that on. GFCI protection everywhere. That's all good. Dishwasher, I turn that on a short cycle. Second sink, that works. No leaks there. The rear left burner of the gas stove did not turn on for me. Probably you have to do something that the homeowner knows about, but I don't know. So I take that picture and I, I basically point at what is wrong. The oven turned on, nice oven. Mechanical exhaust goes outside. And then I do a report summary. Because I'm using software, with a click of a button, I can produce a summary report that everyone can share. And then the full report, I may take some time, a few minutes, to make sure it's in good shape, the entire report. And I'll have that available at the end of the inspection or at least at the end of the day. And here's the report. So it looks really nice. When you go through one of my reports and they're online so that you can compare your reports with mine, um, you'll see that I try to throw in as many pictures as possible. People love pictures. And I'll tell you the truth, I don't think a lot of people actually read the entire report. They just look at the summary. But I make really good inspection reports just in case someone reads it. And if you're in court, they're going to ask for your inspection report anyways. So it better be written really well. And there's the pictures of the roof. The downspouts, remember the downspouts are not connected. There's the chimney and the fireplace and that fan wasn't wired in properly. And there's the stucco and the missing kickouts and the holes where the electrical line goes in. And there are all that wood rot here and there. And the cosmetic thing, the painting coating on the porch floor wasn't all that great. And the water hose bibs and the dryer vent pipe has some lint inside it. And that exterior window with the slider, that was falling out of frame. And the steps are missing at that garage door. And the garage door panel is bellying out. And the heating system, that's in good shape, but the air filter was dirty. It needs to be serviced and cleaned every year. And the seller and the homeowner, we all agreed that there's apparently inadequate flow coming to the second floor bedroom over the garage. We figured that out. We ran it, tried to get that air to come out. You can use toilet paper if you wanted to, or tissue paper, and put it over the vent, right? You can see if there's any air coming. If there isn't any air, that tissue paper just lays on top of that register. So it's one of the tricks that we have. There's air conditioning. So it's gonna be serviced and cleaned, and then they're gonna look at that um, airflow coming to that second floor bedroom. And what I do is when there's an improvement or repair needed or a correction, it's red. Um, that has helped me in small claims. Um, I don't try to hide. Uh, someone sued me because uh, they claimed that I missed cat urine on the padding underneath the carpeting in the living room. My client moved in, tore out the carpeting, smelled the padding, cat urine, the seller didn't disclose that they had a cat. So it went back on the seller. And, but I wasn't responsible anyways, because um, it's specifically stated that I'm not responsible. Home inspectors aren't responsible for um, like anything that's underneath the floor covering. We can't see things. We can't report upon things that we can't see. Um, so that was beyond the scope of my inspection. I've won that in small claims in like five minutes, but any correction that I have, I'm going to make sure that my client sees it. I'm not gonna hide it with blue ink or black ink. It's gonna be red and it's gonna be all caps and italicized. So I want my client to improve things or correct things that need to be improved or corrected or to monitor things that need to be monitored, right? Older hot water tank, missing TPR valve. And there's the electrical. Got electrical problems for sure. Remember the overfusing and live wires hanging. No moisture problems. Like I took pictures of good things, right? There's no moisture detected. And I used this moisture probe so that I can, everybody could see that I was trying to do my best to find things. And there's 
the attic door there that, that needs to be corrected. And there's the bathrooms. There's a leak. Remember that leak at the tub there. A few things in the laundry room. And there's the kitchen. And these are all good things like you know, the kitchen system, you have to think of it as a system and then components of that system. So the system is the kitchen and then there's the faucet. That's a component of the kitchen. Garbage disposal, receptacles, GFCI, dishwasher, gas cooktop, gas oven, exhaust fan. And then the, the interiors is the next section and then there's components of the interior. Carbon monoxide detectors, smoke detectors, windows, doors, receptacles, lights, switches, fans, walls, ceilings, floors, security system. And then we don't inspect pools. Um, the house had a pool. Um, back then there was no training uh, or certification program for inspecting pools. So that was um, a while back. I inspected this house a while back. And, but nowadays that uh, would have been inspected by us for an extra $150. And maybe I have an inspector who's learning and he or she does the pool inspection or the ancillary inspections. And then it does the windows and doors and things like that. Or um, I just add a little bit more time to do the pool inspection, probably a half an hour to do the pool inspection. So we need to stretch the time to accommodate that. Half an hour, an extra $150, I'll take that any day of the week. And you do those ancillary inspections to get trained and certified to increase your gross revenue with an InterNACHI at nachi.org slash certification. And there's the illustrations to help me communicate a little bit better, some topics in my inspection report, and you can download that from InterNACHI. There's a report conclusion and a reminder that I do walkthroughs. There's a little letter that I leave behind for the seller, and then I get paid and use a credit card. Everyone uses a credit card and get paid immediately. Receipts go out, shake everyone's hand, give my home maintenance book to my client, connect and network with the real estate agents, make sure that the homeowner who's moving, likely in the same neighborhood, knows about me. And uh, it's all about that nurturing of relationships, right? And uh, I move on to the next job. And that is about it for my inspection of this house. Um, takes a few hours, but man, you can make a great living doing it. Let's see if there are any questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, home, I remember this. Loose GFCI outlet flopping around under jacuzzi. No, it should be secured. You're right, William. What about having the day or hour visible on each photo? Um, I don't like to do that. Uh, it gets in the way, um, but you could, you could. I don't see any problems with it. Um, I, usually the pictures that I take um, are used elsewhere in my marketing and flyers. So I want, don't want that information there. And now I'm using those pictures uh, for webinars, just like this. Do you recommend changing both smoke detectors and carbon? Yeah, every smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector has a date on it. You can open it up and there's usually a date. And I think the recommendation is every five or 10 years. Um, it's good for the homeowner. I always recommend my homeowner just come in, replace them all. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but replace them all and then buy uh, new fire extinguishers as well uh, for the kitchen, especially. Are you making note of all the storage items in the garage? Yeah, um, because um, those pictures help describe the inspection restrictions. I can't see everything. And conditions change when the home owner, that current seller moves out, everything gets cleaned out. And then sometimes you see things, right? That were covered up. And I wanna make sure that um, if someone has a complaint, I get to re-inspect it. And if I see the problem, I'll show the picture and I'll say, well, remember the garage? It was filled with a lot of stuff. And this is why it wasn't in the report. Can't see it, couldn't see it at the time of the inspection because of all these inspection restrictions. I love taking pictures of things. Uh, the dishes in the dishwasher tested limitation. I just run the dishwasher. I don't do clothes dryer or washer. Uh, and that's in my uh, agreement 
that I have with my client. What inspection software are you using? Um, Internetchi has a free checklist to practice. You want to practice, practice, practice. Internetchi is a free inspection checklist software on any device. You can use it. It's not for your clients. Um, and then there's Home Gauge. There's Home Inspector Pro. There's uh, Tap Inspect. There's Spectora. All of these softwares um, are available at a discount for Internetchi members from Inspector Outlet, inspectoroutlet.com, and click software and you can get a discount because you're an internet member. What info do you put in a letter to the seller? Yeah. It says, dear property owner, we understand that a home inspection can be a stressful process. During our inspection, we make every effort to respect your home and leave it as we found it. All of the inspectors at Peach Inspections bring clean shoes and are worn indoors only. During the inspection, we look at over 500 items, some of which need to be tested, opened and closed and turned off and on. We try to put back, back those items to the original setting or condition, but some items may be overlooked. Here's a list of some of the things you wanna check before. Um, make sure that they are back as they were prior to our inspection. Thermostat, GFCI, refrigerators, clocks, kitchens, doors, curtains, things like that. We're always looking to improve our company and our inspection services so we fail to leave your home uh, in satisfactory condition, or if you have any comments or suggestions, we would welcome your feedback. Yep. So we kind of leave that um, as a leave behind. And we also leave uh, a little gift um, on, during every inspection for the, the seller um, in a little gift bag. And you can get those little marketing items from Inspector Outlet. Um, uh, has anyone noticed buyers are waiving inspections in the house? Yep. Um, that has been a trend in, a, in many areas. That trend is going away. There's been a lot of articles like in the Wall Street Journal about home buyers and real estate agents getting in trouble uh, for waiving the inspection. Um, ben, thanks for when you realized you don't have fun. Yeah, so much more fun when you realize you don't have to find everything. That is correct, Daniel. Um, feel, yeah, ha have fun during the inspection. This is one of the best jobs I've ever had. I've uh, dug uh, people's sewer ditches with a shovel. I've been a home uh, builder, uh, backhoe operator, uh, newspaper <laughs> delivery boy. Uh, this is the best thing. I've built homes and inspecting homes is much more fun. It's so much fun meeting new people and helping them make informed decisions. A decision about the most biggest financial decision they'll ever make in their in their lives and you get to meet your neighbors you know they're essentially in your market area that means within driving distance that means essentially your neighbor right so um, you're helping out um, some people and now you're in their network and you take care of them like clients in your network you have a network of clients not just customers customers buy pizza and hammers these are clients and whenever there is a problem in their home you have left behind a home maintenance book with a dozen reasons for you to be called whenever there is a problem. They should call you first. If there's a roof leak, they should call your you, the local trusted third-party neutral home inspector first to give your opinion as to what to do because you all know what the contractor wants. Contractor wants to fix stuff and open things up and keep on going. The home inspector just wants to inspect and educate the homeowner as to the condition of the home. That's all we do all day long. And we have a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of fun doing this webinar. And I thank you so much for um, being a part of the class and going with me through the home inspection. And if you need me, here's my contact information at natchee.org slash contact. The next webinar is at natchee.org slash webinar and listen to the podcast the Home Inspector Podcast at natchee.org slash podcast. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And I thank you for being here during an InterNACHI webinar. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. And I'll see you at the next class. Bye. Good questions. Good questions, everybody. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.